Okay, so now let's discuss how session management works in a servlets world. Right. So, what do I mean by that? I mean how session is maintained by the server. In other words, how the server is able to recognize and remember the client across multiple requests. So one thing you'll have to make a note of is HTTP is a stateless protocol. So HTTP in itself doesn't have the ability to remember the client, to remember from where the request has come from, right? So you send a request from your computer to a server once and HTTP passes on that request to a server. But when you send in a second request from your computer, HTTP doesn't know that the second request has come from the same computer from where the first request has come. So basically HTTP is a stateless protocol. It doesn't have the ability to store the state of the client or the user, right? So maintaining the state is something that the server has to do. So how does it perform? Now let's take the example where you log into your Yahoo mail, you enter your username and password and you send a request to the Yahoo server. The server gets you back the inbox and all the other mes email messages you have. So basically you click on one of the messages, read the message again, navigate to various pages in that website, right? And throughout this process, the server is able to remember you. So the first time you enter your username and password and enter into your inbox and navigate across pages, at each request, the server knows that this is you who's asking for the details and it gives only your details, right? So it's able to remember the user. So how does it happen? So let's have a look. Okay, so let's take this example where client A sends a request. Say client A is trying to access the Yahoo mail and it sends a request with the username of Tom, say for example, right? This is the Yahoo server. So now Yahoo server takes in the request and it sees, oh, okay, it looks like this is a new request from Tom. So let me store his state in a HTTP session object. So it basically creates a new HTTP session object. Now this HTTP session is nothing but a Java object again, right? And it stores the value for that HTTP session object with the, and associates it with the user which has sent in the request. So it created an ID for this HTTP session and the ID is 92 and it also associated this ID with the user which actually sent in the request. So the user is Tom. So it has associated this HTTP session 92 ID with the user Tom. Okay. Basically creates a new HTTP session and sets the attribute Tom to this HTTP session and then it gives back the response to the client and it also gives back the ID of the HTTP session created. It's also called the J session ID, right? So what happened? You sent in a request to view your Yahoo mail inbox. The server has created a new HTTP session for you and sent back the response that is nothing but your inbox page. Along with that, it has also sent an ID and that ID will help the server to remember you in the future, right? So what happens when now you've got your inbox and you want to check your mail. So you click on your one of your email messages. So again, a request is sent to the server, right? And now when the second request is sent along with the request, even the ID, the session ID, which the server had sent back earlier, the same ID is sent to the server, right? And now when the server gets the second request, it checks, okay, do I have a HTTP session created for this user? You'll see, oh, okay, the user has sent me some ID. Let me check. Okay, 92. All right, I found one HTTP session object with this user and associated with this ID, 92. So now the server is able to validate the user and it's able to remember the user at this request. So it knows that this is Tom who's asking for his inbox details. So it gives the message back to the user, right? 
so in this way basically the server or the web container manages the sessions across multiple requests right okay so now we've seen that using this session id concept the server is able to maintain and manage sessions across multiple requests right but how exactly the session id information is passed to the server i'm sorry passed to the client and again in turn the session id how is it sent back to the server right there has to be some means through which the session id should be passed through between the clients and the server right in order to maintain the session so this is how there are basically three ways in which we can do it and one of the ways is through cookies right so basically what happens is the client creates a cookie and sends across the cookie to i'm sorry the server creates a cookie for the client and sends across the cookie to the client and cookies are basically they are small files which are stored on the client machine so this is a physical file which is actually stored somewhere in the client machine and this will contain information about the client and every time the server client will send a request to the server this cookie information is also sent to the server from the client so basically it sends the cookie in the response header which it sends back to the client and it says set cookie and it actually passes the j session id which it has created for this client in this cookie right and what happens is the client stores the cookie okay in its the client basically stores that cookie in the desktop somewhere in the desktop there are some location for predefined location for storing all the cookies so it, the cookie go and goes and sits in sits in that place so now when the client sends sub subsequent request to the server this cookie is also sent to the server along with the request so when this cookie is sent it also gets the j session id basically right so now the container or the server is able to recognize this client and it sees the j session id associates this client with the http request and then it's able to maintain that session so using cookies you can basically maintain the session across multiple requests so this is one of the way so what is another way of maintaining the session number 2 it's url rewriting so what does it mean clients basically can disable cookies so client have the ability to disable cookies on their computer right so the client can say okay i do not trust anyone and i do not want to accept any cookies from any of the websites right so it disables cookies so the server will not be able to send a cookie to the client even though the server is sending a cookie that cookie will not be stored on the client machine so how can session be maintained in that scenario the answer to that is url rewriting okay in the case of url rewriting what happens is the j session id which earlier using cookies was sent in a cookie now will be appended to the url which is sent in to the client right so whatever url the server sends back to the client along with the url the session id is also appended right so similarly from the client side whenever the second request comes in the client appends that url again to the request which the server had sent him previously right so in this way using url rewriting the client and server can maintain the session okay so what do you go for do you go for url rewriting or do you go for cookies what is the best mechanism to maintain the session so the answer is basically for the first time the server sends a response back to the client it employs both methods it sends a cookie and also it sends the j session id in the url right so it doesn't know the server doesn't really know whether the client has disabled or enabled cookies right so it'll say okay let me try both the things together first so it sends both the cookies as well as it appends a u j session id to the url and sends the response back to the client now if the client 
had not disabled cookies the client would have sent back a cookie in the next request and then the server would have known that oh okay so looks like the client has not disabled cookies so let me continue using cookies now so for the request from there on the server will only send cookies but now say for example if client had disabled cookies so it wouldn't have sent back a cookie in the subsequent request it would have but obviously it would have appended the j session id to the url and sent back in the next request so now when the server sees that there is no cookie but there is only a j session id appended to the url it knows that the client has disabled the cookies so then for subsequent request there or from there on it only employs the url rewriting method for maintaining the session so basically this is how the session is maintained across multiple requests right and one of the ways i, I told you earlier that there are three ways right so the third method is through the uh, what do you call hidden form parameters okay that is using jsps we won't look into that in much detail so this should be enough right for session tracking okay so till now we have discussed everything about servlets all that we need to know about servlets we have discussed it right and how do you actually so initially i told you that the web server or http server can only handle and service static html pages but whereas if you want to go for any dynamic content you go for go with the servlets so how do you basically print out a dynamic content on a html so this is the answer to that you write out dot println statements in your html i'm sorry in your servlet so that this is visible on the client's ui right so this goes this out dot println goes on to the client screen so whatever it says so this actually is the output which is stored which is sent in as a response to the client right so this is nothing but here what i'm doing i'm i'm just writing a simple do get method wherein i'm getting the response writer response dot get writer and i'm simply saying out dot println html html body and println hello so that means this is a html file and it only contains one word that is hello in the body of that file hello and name whatever whoever the person who has requested for this it prints out hello space the name of the person so this is how servlets is able to put in the ui code in its class right but if you have a look at this this becomes a mixture of business logic with html right basically servlets should only be used to perform some business logic for creating dynamic content but here what you are doing is you are performing business logic for creating dynamic content but at the same time you are even doing your html stuff in this servlet itself so this is a very bad practice right so you have to actually write your apps in such a way that your business logic entity is separate and your presentation logic entity is separate so you'll have to separate out these two things the business logic and presentation logic should be two separate things and it should not be mixed into one whole thing it creates more confusion right and it's not very clear so your servlet should only take care of all the business logic part and the presentation logic part should be done somewhere else and what is that somewhere else where is that somewhere else the somewhere else is nothing but jsps so this is where jsps had come into the whole servlet picture jsps are used to provide the presentation logic right to the client so this is nothing but jsps are similar to html's but within this these are but some special kind of html you can write java code within this html right so this is html plus java is nothing but jsps right 
so this take care of all your presentation logic for beautiful ui look and your servlet should actually take care of all your business logic right so separation of concerns is what we are doing here the jsp is only concerned about presentation logic and servlet should only be concerned about the business logic right so now but in the end a jsp is nothing but a servlet okay so everything you write in a jsp ultimately goes into a servlet so who creates this servlet it is the web container who is responsible to create a servlet out of this jsp so we have just discussed the jsp is nothing but html plus java right so ultimately this whole thing is converted into a servlet so previously we have seen that in the servlet class you write out dot println statement and ultimately when you write a java i'm sorry when you write a jsp program with a nice beautiful ui look and feel html tags and all the stuff and the container converts that jsp program into a servlet your servlet will ultimately look the same as you have this out dot println statements okay but that is not your responsibility conversion of that jsp to the servlet is the responsibility of the web container so you basically write as a programmer a jsp page wherein you'll put your html tags with all that java content in it and then that servlet is translated into a java file okay and then that java file is compiled and it is loaded and initialized as a servlet right so ultimately in the end a jsp is nothing but a servlet so when the first request for that jsp comes in what container does is it translates that jsp into java compiles it and loads that compiled java class as a servlet right and from there on it's a servlet so basically jsp are also a servlet but when you code in you code in as a jsp and it ultimately becomes a servlet right okay so let's discuss some of the jsp elements i told you that you can write java code within jsp elements right jsp tags so apart from the general html tags whatever you have you can even embed some java elements and how do you embed that java elements using these jsp elements so these are the four different jsp elements which you can embed in a jsp file apart from the html tags so number 1 is scriptlets So whatever Java code you want to write within your JSP, you can put that in this scriptlet tag. So when you say this Angular brackets and percentile, whatever you write between this Angular bracket and percentile will go in, will be treated as a pure Java code. So whatever Java code you want to write in your JSPs, you can put them in this scriptlet tag. Okay, number two, expressions. so expressions looks something like this percentile is equal to and some java some java code but what happens with the value of this expression this whatever you put within this expression tag goes directly as a output to this out dot println statement so whatever you put in this expression goes into this out dot println statement right so the out dot println what does it mean it means you are printing something to the ui right so it basically prints out this value of i it replaces i with the value of this i right or value of d dot get name okay so basically expressions are input to out dot println statements number 3 declarations so declarations again it's something like this ampersand percentile and exclamation mark and what again you write your java code within that but whatever you want to perform initialization that has to be done only once you put that in the declarations element right and number 4 directives what are directives you have got different types of directives pages include tagline okay so basically when a 
JSP is translated, right? When the JSP is translated and converted back into a servlet, what is the first thing the container does? The first thing the container does is it looks for the directives and it looks for all the directives and directive starts with angular bracket percentile at the rate. So it looks for all the directives and it checks what the directive is and it acts accordingly, right? And it first processes the directive and then it goes into the code and tries to convert all these things, whatever JavaScript lets, expressions and declaratives we write, it tries to convert that into servlets. But the first thing it looks into and converts is the directives, okay? So here we have page directives. And in the page directives, we can write import statements like the general Java imports, whatever classes you want to import packages classes, right? And the include directive, you can include files. So whatever file you include here will directly be replaced in your JSP file. So say for example, in my JSP a.jsp, I say that include directive include file is equal to b.jsp. So wherever I write this code in my JSP a.jsp, the whole content of b.jsp is replaced as it is in my a.jsp at the location where I write this include statement, right? Number three, taglib directories. You have this URI and prefix attributes for this taglib directive. So basically you can have, you can add tag libraries to your JSPs and that's a little bit advanced concept which we will not be discussing in this session, right? So just make a note that you have a tag lib directly where you can give the URI and prefix for your tag libraries which you use in the JSPs. You can, you'll be having more description on these tag libraries and stuff in the JSP session, right? So basically these are the four JSP elements which you can put in in a JSP. So you can only have scriptlets, expressions, declarations and declaratives apart from the basic HTML tags which you have in your JSPs. So apart from your HTML tags, these are the other elements which you can have in a JSP, right? So now, in the previous page, we have discussed about the different JSP elements. And I also told you earlier that a servlet, I'm sorry, a JSP is in the end nothing but a servlet, right? So how do you determine what elements goes into which part of the code in your servlet. That's very important for you to know, right? Okay. So we've seen, the first thing we've seen is nothing but the scriptlets. And I told you that scriptlets are nothing but Java code, right? So this is nothing but a scriptlet, okay? And where did this go in your Java code? It went into this section. And this is nothing but the JSP service section. JSP service is nothing but an implementation of the service method of your servlets, right? So the container will not override the do get or do post method. It simply overrides the JSP service method and puts all your business logic in that JSP service method, right? So your scriptlets go into the JSP service method. So whatever scriptlet I had written, it has gone into the JSP service method. Now, where did this declaration code go? This declaration code, if you see, had gone outside the service method. So whatever you put in your declarations elements doesn't go into the JSP service method. It goes outside the JSP service method, right? Now, so this was one more thing which we have in this. Okay, one more thing we discussed about is this again was declarations, right? Which had gone outside the JSP service method. The whole declaration block, which we added a, in which we added a method had gone outside the service method. So there, this is a new method in this new servlet class, right? And then we discussed about the page directives, about directives, right? And this is the page directive in which I have imported foo.star this has gone as an import statement in the ultimate final servlet class right and now you see that apart from these 
JSP elements, the scriptlets and declarations and whatnot. I also have a HTML, this my general HTML. So where does all this HTML code going to? So this hello welcome is nothing but a HTML code. Where does this HTML code going to? All the HTML code also goes into the JSP service method. So here you see again the container actually had written the out dot println statements for you. So this is a HTML and HTML body tag and then it writes the hello welcome and then it also closes the it should also close the HTML and body tag which I have not shown it here, right? So this is how your JSP is actually converted into servlets ultimately, right? All right, so I think this, the session would have given you some picture on the basic understanding of servlets and why you use a servlet and how do you use a servlet and how JSP comes into the picture and how JSP is ultimately converted into a servlet, right? And what's the role of a web container in this whole process? So now we'll go ahead and I'll show you a demo where you will see how to code this servlet and how to use all the concepts which I had talked in the session.